Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk. And uh, today I'm going to present something which might be quite different from many other papers you will see in this conference. Right? Usually in security, what we want is trust. We get some trust, and then we get the security properties we want. But in this paper, what we want is distrust. And as you will see later, the security property we want is actually obtained from distrust. So let's start from smart contracts, right? People say smart contracts is the next big thing in blockchain research and also applications. Then what exactly is a smart contract? So in the simplest term, a smart contract is a piece of program stored in the blockchain and executed by the peers who maintain the blockchain. And uh, the correctness of execution is actually guaranteed by the consensus protocol of the blockchain. So if you believe in the consensus protocol, then you can think this smart contract as being executed by a trusted global virtual machine. A smart contract is self-enforceable. That means you don't need a third party like a court or like law enforcement to enforce your policy, uh, to enforce your contract. And it also requires less trust because there is no trusted authority. You just trust the blockchain peers. And also it's cheaper to use. The transaction fee is really low comparing to the traditional contract we now use. So the question, right, smart contracts is so good. And then people often ask, what can you do exactly with smart contracts except for ICOs? Right. So today I'm going to show you an example, a application where we use smart contracts to implement a mechanism designed based on game theory in order to enable verifiable computing in the cloud. So we all know, right, the cloud, there is no cloud, they are just computers belong to the others. And since the cloud is owned and run by a third party, usually they are not trusted. They are often modeled as, as an adversary, right? And that leads to the problem of verifiability. So we have a client, the client outsources some computation to the cloud, and then cloud do the computation return a result. But the client doesn't trust the cloud. And it's really difficult for the client to believe this result is correct. Or there is no way to figure out whether it's correct or not correct. And this can be quite annoying, especially when this computation is very important. Recently, we have seen a lot of papers, a lot of work about verifiable computing. In general, there are two ways to do that. One is based on cryptography, where the cloud computes a cryptographic proof. And then the client can verify the correctness of, of computation by checking the proof. Another way is based on replication. So the client use multiple clouds to do the same computation, and then in the end, verify the computation by a consensus protocol. So existing solutions, although they may be technically sound, economically, they make little sense. Why is this? Because the cloud is not free. You pay what you use. And without verifiability, that's how much the client needs to pay. Now, with crypto-based approach, that is how much the client needs to pay. Because this proof is difficult to compute, and the amount of computation needed is often thousands or even millions times of the computation you outsource, uh, right? For replication-based approach, the cost is actually inflated by a factor n because you need to use n cloud. When this n is big, it's also not affordable. So the question is, whether we can have verifiable cloud computing with the low cost, right? 
The goal is the client should pay more or less the same or even less as when he use uh, its own IT infrastructure, which he trusts. Now, with crypto-based approach, it's probably quite difficult because the gap is so big. With replication-based approach, it might be possible if we can pay only two replicas. The question is, everyone knows, when you use two replicas, the biggest problem is collusion. If the two clouds collude and give the clients the same wrong result, the client cannot detect it. And the cloud do have motivation to do that. For example, more profit. And also, it's relatively easy for the cloud, for two clouds, to collude. In the past, if we want to prevent collusion, we have to enlarge the number n, right, to make it difficult. But this is not an option in our case, because we are restricted to use only two replicas. So what can we do? Now the problem is collusion. So we try to deal with collusion. So our idea is actually to use economic means to undermine the foundation of collusion, which is trust. So collusion has been studied for many years by economists, and then they have made a lot of uh, key observ observations. But firstly, this collusion is profit-driven. Usually collusion is against the law. Without additional profits, there is no motivation for parties to collude. That's first thing. Second thing, colluding parties, they have their own interests. They are not one entity. More interestingly, they are often competing with each other. Think about cloud, right? Microsoft, Amazon, Google, they are actually competing with each other for the market share. And thirdly, colluding party, they don't necessarily trust each other. Often the case is, if two parties, they collude, and then one party deviates from collusion, this deviating party can actually get a higher profit. So they have motivation to deviate, and that makes them untrustworthy to the other. Now, without trust, they cannot collude, because collusion requires cooperation. So, in our toolbox, actually, we have two things we can use. One is game theory. We can use game theory to design a game, and in the game, collusion is the less favorable uh, choice. There are better options. And another thing is we can use this game to create distrust, so that the parties will not collude because they, will, they fear they will be betrayed by the other, and in the end, they will end up in a worse situation. And we can use smart contracts to implement the game and then to get the properties we want. So before going on, I want to say a few things. So this is not a solution for everything, and it may not be a solution for you if you believe certain things or if you don't believe certain things. For example, if you believe the clouds are reliable, then you don't need this system because you don't have the verifiability problem and you always get the correct result. If you believe the cloud providers will admit what they have done wrong and compensate fairly, then you don't need this system. You just ask them and get your compensation. If you believe or if confidentiality is your problem, then this system is not for you because we don't deal with confidentiality. All the computation here is in plain text. And if you believe you are targeted by the cloud provider, and then they will use all kinds of attack to attack you, then this is not for you, because we only deal with rational adversary, not irrational ones. So in the adversary model, we have the following parties. We have an honest client. That is more or less inherited from verifiable computing literature uh, in which clients is always honest. And we have two clouds, 
They are modeled as rational adversaries. Rational means two things. Firstly, uh, they are profit-driven, and they always try to maximize their payoffs. Secondly, they are smart. They can understand all consequences of the game. The two clouds must be separate. They have their own judgment, and also they act in their own interest. It's not like something like uh, two branches of the same company. They must be separate. We also assume there is a trusted third party. So you might say, uh, if you have a trusted third party, then everything can be solved trivially. This TTP is special. It's special in the sense that it doesn't need to be online if there is no dispute. And secondly, and more interestingly, if the cloud are rational, then we don't actually need to involve the TTP. So this is something like nuclear weapons, right? So the meaning of nuclear weapons is you know I have a nuclear weapon, you know I can use my nuclear weapon. Once you know that, I don't need to use my nuclear weapons, right? Here is the same. The important thing is the cloud. They know there are such a, a TTP, and they know the TTP can be called. And then once they know that, we don't actually need to use the TTP or call the TTP. So the existence of the TTP is enough. So here we have a list of assumptions, and I hope they are justifiable. So one thing is the client cannot recompute the task. Otherwise, the client can compute everything by itself without even ask the cloud. Second thing is the tasks are deterministic or can be reduced to deterministic. So this is another assumption actually inherited from verifiable computing literature. We also assume the tasks are not time critical because we have no control over timing on blockchain. And we assume the funds only flow among the parties, but not to or from an external party. For example, we don't consider the case where you have a law enforcement and it's imposed some uh, penalty. This is something we don't consider. For simplicity, we also have the following assumptions. They are just there to reduce the number of variables and to simplify analysis. They don't really change the equilibrium. Later, you will see. So let's start from the first contract the prisoner's contract. So this is the outsourcing contract. In the contract, basically, the client says, I have this task, fx. Can you compute it for me, and then I will pay you a salary, w. For the cloud, they have a cost associated with this computation, which is c. Before the cloud can get this job, the cloud must pay a deposit of amount D, which needs to satisfy this relation. And then the contract also says, the cheating cloud, if it's caught, then it will lose its deposit. So there is a punishment. It also says for an honest cloud, if the other cloud cheats, then the honest cloud will get an additional reward. So there is an incentive for honest behavior. So I'm going to skip the details of how these contracts work. And if you are interested, then you can talk to me later, and I can explain everything to you. So the contract, in the end, induce a game like this. So after analyzing the game, we found there is only one sequential equilibrium. So a sequential equilibrium is a stronger form of Nash equilibrium. So here we use sequential equilibrium because we need to deal with imperfect information. And in this case, Nash equilibrium can have weak cases where the parties play irrational. So this sequential equilibrium basically eliminates those weak cases and makes sure parties always are rational. So given this equilibrium, the game always ends here. So cloud one will send the correct result, cloud two will also send the correct result, and then they get the payoff. So basically, they both will be honest. 
So the analysis of this game is actually quite involved. Uh, here are some high-level ideas. So this game is quite similar to the prisoner's dilemma game. And in this game, collusion is not a stable state. Because if one cheats, the best strategy for the other is actually to be honest and to get a higher payoff. Now, both clouds now have motivation to deviate from collusion. So what they will do is try to encourage the other to cheat and they remain honest itself. And in the end, they will both be honest. Now, there is only one problem, right? This equilibrium in the game only holds when both players cannot make credible commitments. But this is not true, especially when we have smart contracts. A self-enforcing contract is exactly a credible commitment. So that the cloud actually can use another contract to change the game. So here, right, one cloud initiates collusion and talk to the other, let's collude, and then I will pay you an additional bribe amount B, so that you will get better payoff in the end if you collude. And also for both clouds, they need to pay in a deposit T, which need to be large enough. So the contract here says, anyone who deviates from collusion will be punished by losing the deposit. Now, the game changed to this one. So here we can see this is the equilibrium path. So it says the ringleader preferred to initiate collusion and the follower will prefer to collude and both will prefer to send agreed wrong results. And in the end, they collude. That's the best strategy for them. So what can we do? Actually, we are going back to the beginning, right? We want to use smart contracts to prevent collusion, but in the end, we found smart contracts actually enabled the cloud to collude. And even worse, if we try to design another contract to counter back, the two clouds can always find a way to counter counter back. And this loop is endless. So what can we do? So in the end, what we did is this traitor's contract. This contract is not to counter the colluder's contract directly. But the aim of this contract is to incentivize the cloud to report collusion. So there are two incentives. The first one is the first cloud who report the collusion will not be punished by the prisoner's contract. The second is this reporting cloud will get an additional reward if the collusion is true. So why reporting is important? Because if the, re the collusion is reported, then the client can always call the TTP. And then the TTP can find out who cheated. And also, once this collusion is reported, the TTP is called, then there is no point to counter back using another smart contract. Because what your payoff now depends on only what you have done, whether you cheated but not the other party's behavior. So there is no point to use another smart contract to incentivize the other party to behave in a certain way. That doesn't help. So the consequences of the, of the contract is actually this. It actually creates distrust between the cloud. So they both know the other party's best strategy is to betray. And if one tries to initiate collusion, the other will say, yes, let's collude, but later it will report to the client. And if both knows that, and if both clouds are rational, then no one would actually want to initiate collusion because later you will be betrayed, you will end up with the worst payoff. And then both will stay honest because there is no way to collude and then you just be honest.
So one question about this reporting mechanism is whether someone can misuse it. For example, there is no collusion, and then I report a case of collusion. Can I be better off by doing so? So we analyze the case and find out under the contract, if there is no collusion, then the best strategy is not to report and then behave honestly. Well, putting everything together, we have this game. So here we can see, right, the cloud who initiates collusion, if, if it initiates collusion, right, it will end up here. And with the payoff minus D minus B, which is negative. But at this point, this cloud has another option, right? Not to initiate collusion. And if this cloud goes this way, it will end up with the payoff W minus C, which is a positive number. So this cloud will always prefer to have a higher payoff and then will always prefer not to initiate collusion. And then both will stay honest. So we have implemented the contract using Solidity and run the contract on the official Ethereum network. So in the contract implementation, we actually used some light crypto to preserve data privacy because uh, this blockchain is public, right? You can see everything, everyone can see everything. And you don't really want your data to be on the blockchain and everyone can view it. So we use a commitment to hide the value and also to bound the value to the, uh, to the contract. And we use non-interactive zero-knowledge proof to let the miners to verify equality or inequality between values. So for the cost, it's actually quite small. For all transactions, the highest cost is something like $0.4. So it's really nothing. So this is our first paper. Obviously, there are a lot of things we don't have time to do. And here are some future directions we would like to explore. For example, what if the client is an adversary? So if you talk to cloud providers, they always think clients is an adversary. They don't trust the client. But if we model the clients as an adversary, then we have to change a lot of things to prevent attacks from the clients. Another thing is actually multi-interaction and the repeated game. Currently, the contract is for one-off computation. But in reality, the clients may have multiple tasks to outsource and need to interact with the cloud multiple times. And this repeated interaction can change the dynamic significantly. And we need other ways to prevent attacks uh, in this multi-interaction uh, scenario. And we also want a more efficient deposit mechanism, right? So for the cloud, each computation is need to put in some deposits, and what if the cloud had millions of uh, clients? Then the cloud needs a very large cash reserve to pay the deposit, which they don't have. And then here, what we want is a more efficient deposit mechanism, so we can lower the bound and make it also affordable for the cloud. And the last thing is whether we can use smart contracts in other cases to prevent collusion. For example, e-voting. In e-voting, collusion is actually a big problem. Either the voters, they collude, or the parties who run the collusion uh, to run the voting may collude. If we can prevent collusion, then that will make e-voting much better. So that is more or less what I want to say. And thank you very much. And I'm here to take questions. So thank you for the talk. Is it on? Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, so thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions here. The first is, who do you envision to play the role of a TTP? Because that's sort of a central trust thing, which, which is kind of crucial in, in case of a collusion. So that's the first question. And the second question is, you mentioned another use case, possible use case like e-voting. But uh, for collusion, what do you think in other kinds of questions where the question is about maintaining the privacy? For example, a secret shared the key on two servers. So mm -hmm. would your technique in any way carry over there? And a third question is, can you generalize it to more than two servers? What, what would be the difficulty there in general? Like, can you, for example, do away with TTP if you have three servers uh, instead of two? Okay, yeah. so yeah. let me rephrase your question. The first one is uh, about the, this TTP. This TTP is a too strong mm -hmm. assumption. Is that your question? Yeah. Right. So here we assume there is a TTP. But uh, currently we don't care how this TTP is implemented. Mm -hmm. So one thing you might notice if you read the paper is actually the client doesn't pay the TTP. It's always the cheater pay the TTP. So the TTP can be implemented in any way, how complex we don't care, and how expensive we don't care. It can be, for example, another blockchain which do this uh, trusted computation and very expensive. But currently we don't care, we just assume this is uh, something we can get. Hopefully later we have other mechanisms to get it. So that's about TTP. And the second question is about uh, e-voting, right? Uh, so I don't exactly, can you, can you remind me? Right, right. Yes, so currently we don't consider confidentiality. So confidentiality is definitely something we would like to investigate later, but I guess it's very difficult in this case because here uh, it's, it's very difficult for, to detect attacks of uh, like confidentiality attacks. And uh, what's, what's the third <laughs> Right, so more servers, right. So in, in, in our case, verifiable cloud computing, we don't really want more servers because that's increased the cost. We want only two servers. But in other cases, like other use cases, maybe yes, this is possible because there is no way, say, we just have two, two servers. But the game must be changed, I guess, because you have more than two parties and then the game must be different. So I guess it will be case by case, depending on your application and your settings. It's not to really say we have a general idea how to how to proceed. Yeah. So Pedro Moreno Sanchez from Purdue University. Uh, nice talk. Um, I saw that the contract that you are using is in Ethereum. Um, I was just wondering whether you are using Ethereum because it's just one of the blockchains out there, or there are some specific operations that are only in that blockchain. That's why you have used it. Right. In other words, uh, have you identified the minimal operations that you need and see if it's possible to do it with other blockchain systems that we have out of there today? Right. So basically here, what we need, we need something like crypto uh, operations. And we also need to do certain uh, storage operations that basically data storage, right? Store certain things. And then we also need to test certain conditions. So Ethereum, we use Ethereum because it's the most convenient thing and it has a high level language which is easier to, to program. For other systems or platforms, currently we didn't know exactly what can we do. But later maybe, yes, if they provide enough support, then this thing can also be implemented on those platforms. Yeah. Thank you. So can you browse the system and see for the Yeah. Okay.